Yes, welcome back. Um, so we will look at John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Uh, that's called the prologue. Um, it's like a summary of all that's actually going to be covered later on throughout the gospel. So he, uh, John, just mentions very briefly all the very main things which he's going to be discussing in greater detail in the rest of his gospel. So that is why this uh, these verse, uh, 18 verses are referred to as prologue. They are like an introduction to all that's going to be coming up later on in the gospel. Uh, so here in the prologue, um, he talks about the... Just a minute. Yeah, he, he talks about many um, um, themes, such as the, uh, the word, who is the word, the identity of the word. He talks about life, light. Uh, he talks about regeneration. Uh, he talks about uh, how the... Uh, father is revealed through Jesus. You know, all these things he are mentioned within these first 18 verses. And then you have a more detailed explanation of that uh, later on. Okay, so um, just for us to understand a little bit about the setting of this uh, gospel, the people that he is writing to, you know, in, in this gospel, these are believers who are facing persecution from the from their fellow Jews and they're also facing persecution from uh, the Romans the fellow Jews you know their relatives and friends who are still part of the Jewish faith and who have not yet become followers of Jesus they kind of look down on them because um, they don't regard Jesus as being divine and uh, so they feel that these Christians are in some way being um, are in some way betraying the Jewish faith by becoming followers of Jesus. Because Jesus says, you don't, you no longer need to follow the uh, covenant of Moses because I am now introducing a new covenant. Is what Jesus says. Um, and so uh, the the Jewish people are against the Christians. Because these Christians are no longer following the uh, covenant of Moses. So uh, they are receiving pressure from their Jewish relatives, friends, family members. And at the same time, these people are also facing persecution from the Roman authorities. Because um, in all the places where you know, Rome had established its direct control, uh, they expected the people of those regions to worship uh, the emperor Caesar as though he is some kind of a god. So whether or not the people actually believed in his uh, godhood, uh, they at least felt obliged to go to certain designated temples and perform certain rituals, uh, which would kind of, um, I know, honor the, C the Caesar or something of that sort. Uh, is so uh, the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish leaders took special permission from uh, Caesar to not have to do that because, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I mean uh, if one thing they had learned throughout their Old Testament life uh, is that, you know, after, after God had scolded them again and again for their idolatry and again and again had punished them and finally had even sent them into exile because they could not learn that one basic lesson that you shall not worship other gods. So, Finally, when they come back from the exile, you know, after they have lived over there in another nation without any identity, without having any temple of their own, without having any honor or respect, when they finally come back to the to Jerusalem, these exiles who return, they still have the sinful nature in them. So you still see them backsliding. But one lesson they learn is no more idly worship. So if you actually look at the history of the Jewish people, after they come back from Babylon, you never again see them getting back into idol worship. They still have many other defects and uh, you know uh, issues. Uh, but uh, this is one thing which has been kind of wiped out from their system, uh, at least to some extent. So we see that um, 
uh, they are uh, they do not give in to this idea of worshipping caesar and so the jewish authorities in fact gain get special permission that they will not have to go and perform those rituals for caesar and uh, so the jewish people are excluded from having to do this but when the when certain jews become believers and become part of the christian community now they are no longer regarded as jews in the full sense of the term so now you see they have to follow the rule which applies to all other people of worshiping caesar so this kind of was creating extra problems for them the roman authorities had accepted the fact the jewish people will not perform the rituals required for caesar's worship but there was no legal papers in place saying that the christians can have the same privilege of avoiding worship of caesar so now the minute they began to call themselves christians the jewish people disowned them and said no these people are no longer part of our community and so now when they are no longer part of the jewish community it means now they come under that law which says that they have to go and worship caesar and no way are believers going to be doing that these are people who have taken a stand for the lord i you know going against their own family members going against their own relatives and neighbors so when they have taken that stand for the lord no way are they going to go and bow down to the emperor so this was creating problems for them even among the roman authority from the roman authorities so these were a persecuted people there would have been days when doubts would have come into their mind and they would have asked themselves what we are going through is it really worth it i mean uh, was jesus really the lord when he came down um, did he really rise up from the dead should we be following him and so you see that is why it was so essential that john write down this particular gospel uh, which is why like it says in that moratorium canon um, you know his friends urge him to write down a record and like it says so there in that canon you know it he, uh, it would also records that under the inspiration of the spirit he decides to write down a spiritual gospel is, is the term used over there so he does this uh, because it is necessary for these for these believers who are undergoing so much pressure from outside from the authorities from their own neighbors and from their own community they are no longer invited to weddings which is like a humiliation they have gone they were going through a lot so they needed to they needed someone to say you know what i am somebody who has seen and touched jesus i am somebody who was walking with him i am someone that jesus loved and i am writing to you these facts so without any fear or doubt you can trust in this lord jesus and accept that he is divine that he is the son of god he was not just some prophet who came and went he actually rose from the dead to prove his divinity so you can trust him these are the things which john brings out in his gospel so you know he is writing to this kind of an audience and of course he's also uh, writing to the you know uh, greeks and the other gentiles who also can place their faith in the lord jesus so it is to such people that he is writing and so in his prologue in the introduction he brings out these things he makes sure that he mentions all the main things he first of all he establishes the fact that jesus was not only with god but he was also god himself so that's established in the in john 1 1 itself and then from there in the next few verses immediately he starts talking about how uh, you know jesus is the one who brings life and he is the light and it goes on to talk about how certain people who place their faith in jesus they are the ones who will be declared as children of god so in in that sense it it talks even about regeneration the new birth all the important concepts which are going to be discussed in greater detail in the gospel of john all these are touched upon at least through one word or phrase they are all touched upon in this initial prologue and there are some people who say that this prologue was probably in the form of a um, did you say something uh, yeah uh, so it there are some who say that this prologue was uh, written in the form of a hymn 
so they say that the believers would actually sing out this these 18 verses now i do not know whether that was actually uh, you know uh, factual whether that happened or not uh, but they say that when you look at the uh, the greek wording the way that entire uh, it was 18 verses were arranged it looks like as if there is a kind of rhythm to it and so there is a chance that maybe it was actually sung as a hymn by the believers so whenever the you know if it were a song i mean if they were actually singing it in those days it would almost be like a hymn which is declaring this is what we believe about jesus you know so it would be like a declaration of uh, their faith so um, uh, it does have a rhythm to it in the greek language so it might have been you know sung by those people uh, yeah um, so getting into john chapter 1 verse 1 uh, maybe we can look at the first two verses uh, yeah, if we can have uh, uh, someone read out john chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 uh, you know, we had uh, this um, Zelitoli, I think. Yeah, that's the name. Um, yes. I mean, I didn't think I had any interaction with you last year. So it's good to see you here now. And uh, yeah, so if uh, Zelitoli or anyone else at all, it doesn't matter who, if someone can read out for us uh, verses 1 and 2. Yes. Okay, John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Exactly. It says he was in the beginning with uh, God. And in the earlier verse, it's confirmed that he was God as well. So it's not that just he was with God, he himself was God. Um, the one point that John seems to be trying to bring out here is that uh, this Jesus was there in the beginning, which means he would be there even before creation itself. Uh, because uh, uh, if we were to look at the beginning of Genesis, we see the wording over there, um, Genesis 1 verses 2 to 3. You know, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, that's what it says. So it mentions how there was nothing in place. Uh, the earth was without form and void, but the spirit of God was already there hovering over the face of the waters. That's the uh, wording we see in Genesis chapter 1, 1. So John is trying to bring out the point here that in that beginning, even before the earth was formed, the word was already there. And that word was there you know, um, as Jesus. And Jesus was God. So he's establishing these facts. He's pointing out that this Jesus predates even time and creation. So we, we observe that. And then, of course, we have this very popular word that is used over there. So if you were to actually look at the Greek, the original Greek Bible, uh, when you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, we are using the word, uh, the term word, the word was already, in, um, I mean, the word was God. Uh, but over there in the Greek Bible, uh, the term logos would be used. That's the Greek word which is used over there. So in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. This is a very um, um, well, um, it's, it's a popular phrase in the sense a lot of sermons have been preached about this term logos. Uh, but when uh, when when these when this term was first used by John right at the beginning of his gospel, it would have actually got a reaction out of the people. Both the Jews reading this very first sentence and the Greeks reading this very first sentence would have really sat up and thought about it. Because for them, the word logos had significance. It meant something to them. So let's look at what significance this term had for the um, Greek people. 
they believed that there's this universal power which runs and controls the universe. That is their belief system. So in their belief system, they believe that there is, there is this uh, power which exists. And they, 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 in fact, called it the ultimate reason. Reason as in, you know, uh, rationale, the, the ability to think. So they believe that there is, there is this intelligent power which exists, which can think and which can make things happen. And this power is what um, made the world come into existence. And this power has the reasoning and the intelligence to, uh, to continue keeping it running so that there will not be any chaos you know, in the future. So even in their belief system, they believe that in the very beginning there was chaos. Everything was void and shapeless. But into that chaos came this intelligent power which could think. And it brought order out of the confusion. So that was their understanding of the term logos. So when these Greeks would gather together and have intellectual conversations and they would talk about philosophy, and they would use the term logos. This is what they had in mind, a power that has brought everything into existence. Now, John, in his very first sentence, is declaring and saying, you know what? You guys have been talking a lot about logos. I will tell you who that logos is. I can give you the identity of this logos. This logos is actually a person. And this person was with God in the beginning. And he was God himself. This is who logos is. And that would have caught the attention of the Greeks, first of all, because you know, they, he, he, he's adding a face to their, um, you know, their, their very impersonal, vague uh, concept of a power. He's actually putting a face on that, and he's saying Jesus is that logos. But John goes one step further over here, fully knowing how shocking this will sound to the you know people. Um, he says. Uh, in um, yeah, he was with God in the beginning, and then if we were to move into uh, verse three, uh, if someone can read out first John verse three, oh, no, no, John itself, yeah, Gospel of John. Uh, if you could read out John one verse three, please. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Exactly. So uh, he goes on to say that this Logos has created everything that has come into existence. And then later, you know, uh, he uh, it talks about how he came into the world. Um, that would be your verse 10, where it says he was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. So he starts off by talking about logos. He puts a face on this logos and says, you know what, it's no, no other but actually Jesus himself. He's the power which you people have been talking about. And then he goes on to say that this power actually came into the world and lived with the people you know, in this world. Uh, so that would be in verse 10. Uh, so that is not something which the Greek people would have very liked very much. Uh, because they had a very low opinion of the flesh in their philosophy. In their philosophy, the spirit is pure. The spirit is something um, beyond the natural, something to be respected. On the other hand, they regarded flesh as something very low, something very cheap. And so it would not make sense to them. They would ask themselves, why would logos if Logos is a person and not just a force, why would this person, Logos, want to become flesh? Something that is so base and cheap and uh, of uh, no value. They would have looked upon this uh, in uh, from that angle. To them, it would have been shocking that someone so superior would choose to become, uh, to, would choose to put on flesh and be flesh like normal humans. Because uh, for the Greek philosophers, the greatest ambition and aspiration that they had is that one day they can get rid of this body, be done away with it, and 
become a pure spirit. So that was their thinking. So here, John is not only saying that Jesus is the Logos, he is saying this Logos actually came into the world and became, you know, put on flesh the way we have flesh. And they would not have liked this concept. So it would have been shocking to them because of this. For the Jewish people, why would this term Logos have made them sit up and think? Now that's because of Proverbs chapter 8. Now, if we were to go to Proverbs chapter 8, uh, and um, we have this entire section, um, verses 22 onwards, up to maybe verse 33, even beyond that, all of those verses, they talk about wisdom, uh, like as if wisdom, wisdom is a person. Um, we have this happening in Old Testament poetry, you know, where uh, they, they talk about things, they personify the thing in poetry, and they address it as if it is a living being. For instance, uh, you know, the gates of the temple. So the psalmist actually writes, he says, gates, you know, lift up your heads. Obviously, the gates are not going to have any heads, you know, but he's, he's personifying the gate and he's saying, you know what, gates, you should be happy, you should be rejoicing because, uh, you know, uh, the, the king of kings, you know, has entered into you, you know, through your, through your uh, uh, gateways. So he talks to the gates and, he, you know, he, he says, lift up your heads. So in that sense. So here uh, in Proverbs 8, they talk about wisdom like as if wisdom is a lady. And uh, so wisdom is, it's like uh, this particular chapter is written as if wisdom is speaking. And this is what she says about herself. Um, maybe we could just look at verses, um, Proverbs chapter 8. If we can look at verses 22 and 23, please. Yeah, Proverbs 8, 22 and 23. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Exactly. He says, even before the world was created, I am the one of the first things that the Lord made, is what wisdom says about herself. Okay, so over here, it's just wisdom being personified. There was no person named wisdom walking around. Uh, this is just a poetic language. So in poetic language, they are talking about wisdom as if she is a person. And she says to the people, she says, you know, because I have been there from the beginning, because God made me, I participated in the creation, because God would have used his wisdom, right, to make all the things. So it's like as if wisdom is personifying herself in this poetry. And she says, I was there. I was involved in the process of what he did. And I rejoice to see all the things that he created. Therefore, she says in Proverbs 8, she says, listen to me, the words which I speak, the instruction which I'm giving, it is good because I am someone who has lived in God's presence and who knows what God is like. Uh, so again, to repeat, this is poetic language. So there was no person named Wisdom who was created. There was no lady sitting over there named Wisdom, but it's just a poetic language. So what happened in Jewish tradition is as the centuries went by, they began to think about this wisdom as a, uh, if not a person, at least as a force, because they were they were they were listening to these Greeks, and the Greeks kept talking about their logos and how it is their logos which was you know, which has brought the world into order and is keeping the chaos away and all of that, and so they began to think to themselves, do we have something in our writings which is similar to what these people are talking about? And so basically, in that sense, in a very human way, they began to think about Proverbs 8 as a form of logos. So this is how the Jews began to think about logos. And so here, John is declaring and saying, yes, you people may have your own traditional idea of what logos is. You may see it as some kind of wisdom that God used to create the universe. But what I am saying over here is, Logos is not just this wisdom. The actual Logos was God, uh, and he was with God, and he was there even before wisdom came into, I know this, this, this poetic wisdom was anywhere around. Because uh, the poetic wisdom is something which was created 
it says in Proverbs 8:22, the Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. So um, wisdom is something which was created, if you want to use the poetic language over here in uh, Proverbs 8. But the actual logos, there was no creation involved. He was always there. Nobody created him. Nobody made him. He always was there. So now John is kind of urging these Jewish uh, people to rethink their idea of logos. He says logos was in the beginning, even before wisdom was formed. Logos was already there. That is the actual true logos. He is the one who um, has brought everything into existence. And it is through him that everything ca is continuing to exist without chaos. So he is replacing the Greek idea of logos with Jesus. And he's telling the Jews, this is the actual logos which is holding the world together. Jesus Christ, he is the one. Um, and uh, so he's making a very direct statement over here that they need to believe in the divinity of uh, Jesus. Uh, so we see the John saying that in the beginning was the word, and he says the word was with God, and the word was God. So it's one thing for the word to just be with God, but the third phrase very clearly establishes that the word is also equally divine, just like the rest of the godhood and so by um, writing out the sentence john very very clearly affirms that the one god whom we worship the yahweh of the old testament whom we worship he is a triune being generally in our preaching when we talk about jehovah or yahweh we, we generally immediately think of the father alone but no Yahweh is actually uh, triune. He is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because you see, in the Old Testament, the Lord, the God, the Creator that they are talking about is Yahweh. And Yahweh is actually triune. So that's the, that's the concept that he's trying to bring out over here when he says that the Word was with God and the Word was God. So God the Father is a distinct person. And Jesus Christ is a distinct person who is equally divine. Uh, now, uh, this is one verse which has been slightly modified by the Jehovah Witness uh, you know, uh, cult um, for their convenience. So uh, if somebody were to try and, uh, because for them, you see, uh, uh, they believe that Jehovah, Yahweh, is the only God. And Jesus is a lesser God. Somebody that Yehovah created, Yahweh created him. Uh, so he is not fully God in the sense that uh, that God the Father is God, is, is, is their belief system. So when they are quoting this particular verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, this is how they put it. They say, uh, you know, in their, um, in their Bible, what they call the Watchtower New World Translation. In that, this is how you see John 1.1 1, 1 being put. It says over there, in the beginning the word was, and the word was with God. The third portion is where they kind of change things. And they say, and the word was a God. And it's a small g that is used over there. So it's like as if he's a created being is what they wish to say. So when uh, scholars who know the Bible took up this issue with them and they said, why are you, you know, translating this last portion as a God? No, the word was God. But you're making that into the word was a God. Why are you doing that? The reason that they give is that they say, if you look in the original Greek, before that word God, you don't have the article the. The is not mentioned. In the, in the original Greek. So they say because of this, we are saying that it's not referring to God, it's referring to something lesser. It's referring to a God, like the gods of the other nations. So in that sense. So that is the argument which they use. But if you look at their translation, you know, this uh, new world translation of the Jehovah Witnesses, 
they do not apply this rule in many many other places where you do not have the article the so when it comes to matthew 5 9 when it comes to matthew 6 24 luke 135 luke 1 um, 75 and in a whole bunch of other places where you do not have that article the preceding the phrase god they still use the capital g they have no issues in using a capital g in all of those places but only over here in one one because they do not want to accept the divinity of jesus only over here they choose to use the small g in their translation now you can't have double standards like that right i mean it does not make sense so um, uh, so if you know uh, you need to minister to someone who is from that background and they raise this particular um, you know um, argument you will be in a position to explain to them it's there in your notes so if you were to look in your pdf it's there this piece of information is there so you can actually use those verses there's a list of verses where the article the is not there in front of uh, you know before the word god but still the Jehovah Witnesses accept all those portions as God in all of his Godhood. So in the same way, that very same thing is used over here in one one. So you will be able to explain to a person who is seeking and tell them, see, this is a fact. This is a grammatical fact which can be clearly seen. So you do not have to worry and feel that you are in any way being you know, um, wrong in accepting Jesus as Lord. He is very much truly divine and he is Lord. So we can use this argument when we are trying to help a seeker from that background. Um, so um, moving on to verses 3, 4, and 5. Thank you so much, those of you who are reading out the, the scriptures to us. Uh, so yes, if we can have someone read out verses 3, 4, and 5, please. Yeah. The yes. one. All things were made through him, and without him nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Yeah, so you are reading from the NKJV. Okay, um, and I'll explain why I said that. Um, so let's look at the first portion, verse 3, where it says, without him, nothing was made that has been made. So uh, this logos, he, everything that was made has been made through him, which obviously means that he himself was not made because he's the one who's making everything that exists. So it does not include him. Uh, so he is above that, beyond that. So here... It is clearly being established that um, uh, the logos, Jesus, uh, he is the creator. He was there before these things were made. He himself was not created. And uh, you know, Colossians 1.16 confirms the same thought. It says over there, in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, and all of that. Okay, so and then in fact, Colossians 1.16 also says. All things have been created through him and for him. So both John and Paul uh, were clearly trying to convince the Jewish community that yes, Jesus is divine, and you need to believe in his, um, you know, in his divine origin. Now, um, moving on to the next portion of uh, of uh, which is verse four. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Um, it doesn't just say here that, um, it doesn't just say that, you know, he had light and life with him. It says that he himself was the light of all mankind. That life was the light of all mankind is what it says over here. So it's not just that Jesus is a container of life. He himself is life. It's not just a container of light. He himself is light. And then in that sense, keeping that thought in mind, it goes on to say the light shines in the darkness. You know, this Jesus, this light, he shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not, uh, like, you know, uh, Rosalind read out, 
has not comprehended it. On the other hand, if you were reading NIV, it would say the darkness has not overcome it. And both translations are correct, in fact, because that particular Greek word over there can be used in either sense. I may be reading a very tough chapter of uh, in, in chemistry, you know, in the chemistry textbook, and so once I have uh, once I have overcome or grasped, comprehended what is there in that chapter, I would say I have katalambano this particular chapter. I would say that. So in that sense, I have grasped it, I have comprehended it, I have overcome it in that sense. So um, this word can be translated as overcome, or it can be translated as comprehend. But over here, in this particular verse, which would be the actual best translation, which really brings out what John is trying to express. And I think it's actually the NIV, which uh, you know does a better translation. And I'll explain why. So this logos, he is Jesus. And this Jesus, he is the one who is shining into the darkness. And the darkness will not be able to overcome this Jesus. Yes, it's true that the darkness also does not comprehend Jesus because the people of evil, the people of the world, the ones who are in darkness, they choose not to know him. They choose not to comprehend his divinity and bow down to him and submit to him. That is also there. But I think over here, John is more interested in the idea of the darkness being unable to overcome this light, overcome this Jesus, the Logos who is light. Why do we say that? Because you see, um, he he started off with that first verse where he said, in the beginning. And immediately when the Jewish people would have read those words, in the beginning, the Genesis 1 would have come to their minds. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, that is how their scriptures begin. Uh, so he is again now in this verse, connecting Genesis with uh, what he's trying to say over here. Because in Genesis chapter 1, verse, verses 2 and 3, this is what we see. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You know, then the Spirit of God who is hovering over the waters, this is what he says. He says, let there be light, and there was light. There was darkness up to that point of time. It says darkness was on the face of the deep. But now you have light uh, coming in. Once God speaks the words and says, let there be light. And this and the darkness which had been hovering over the face of the deep for goodness knows how long, that is unable to overcome this light which has now come and taken over. So once God says, let there be light, that light is there. So only when it is evening, only when God gives permission for the for the for the evening and the darkness to set in, for that brief amount of time, there will be darkness, physical darkness. But otherwise, uh, the darkness will not be able to overcome the light and completely, you know, drive it out. In the same manner, here in the uh, in John, in the beginning was this word the logos and this logos was light and he was life and once he came in you know john is saying in the same way the physical darkness could not overcome the light the physical light in the same way this jesus the logos who is light what the restoration which he is now bringing into the world through his light the darkness will not be able to overcome it just so that we can grasp this concept a little better, um, um, you know, uh, let's think about Genesis for a bit. If you look at your uh, creation account, when was the sun created? The sun was created on day four. So for the first three days, there was no sun around. So it is not the sun which was providing light to the planet Earth. It was God. God said that there be light and there was light. The word which he spoke, that was light. And it gave light for three entire days when the sun gave no support at that time. The SUN gave no support at that time. The SUN was not even created. It was the SON, the Son of God, the light, who literally lit up the first three days. Because that was a spoken word which God spoke. Let there be light. And there was light. And you know, he he is the one who 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 
lit up the uh, earth for the first three days. And then on day four, you have the sun being placed in the sky. And you know, that starts providing light. Uh, so uh, that is why even in Revelation chapter 21, you know, if you go to the very end and you look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 to 24, there it says the city, you know, that new Jerusalem and the city that is uh, the new uh, um, the new city which is established by God in the new earth. Uh, it says over there, the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. So you, you have a physical light which is being talked about over here. And you also have a spiritual light which is being talked about over here. In the light of the spiritual truth which has been revealed to these nations, they are now saved by it. And they are now walking in it in this new Jerusalem. And who is the light over here? It's the Lamb. The Lamb is its light. He is the glory of God. And he is the one who is illuminating this new Jerusalem. So in the same way, even in Genesis, that's what he did. God, God himself was the light for the first three days. And then he put the sun in place to do its functioning. Um, and so now when this Jesus has come into the world, you know, it says in verse 10, right, that he was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. So over here, he comes into the world. And once he comes into the world, John is declaring and saying, the darkness will not be able to overcome him. That restoration process which Jesus has now initiated because of his final work on the cross, you know, that thing which he has you know, started off, the darkness can never overcome it. So you and I, when, you, when we are facing our challenges in life, we have uh, the evil forces of darkness attacking us even now, even though now we have become children of the Lord. You know, we still sometimes face sickness. Uh, there's poverty and financial issues. Uh, there may be division and you know, rivalry between believers in the church. And when we look at all these things, we may think, my goodness, these sicknesses are so big. These divisions in the church are so deep. The darkness is at work. The dark forces are so strong. And we may think all those thoughts. But it's good for us to remember what it says over here. The darkness will not be able to overcome the light of Logos. Logos has come. He has started something because of his finished work. And what he has started, that the darkness can never overcome it. So even if we feel that the, you know, uh, the things that are lined up against us are big and huge, they cannot overcome the light. Because this is Logos who is, who is, who is casting his light upon us. So when we stand in faith on this Logos, the written word of God, we stand in faith on him and say, this is what he says. And so I choose to believe that this is what he has done for us as believers. And he will fulfill it in his own way, in his own time. When we take our stand and choose to believe this and obey it and hold on to it, the light will overcome the darkness because the darkness can never overcome um, you know, uh, the logos himself. It's impossible for the darkness to do that. So uh, uh, the NIV probably has a slightly better translation uh, when it says that, uh, you know, uh, the darkness, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, so um, we will uh, look at verses 6 to 13, uh, which mainly is talking about, uh, you know, uh, how John the Baptist. Uh, comes and gives witness, he gives testimony and says that, you know, this Jesus, he is the light. So uh, John testifies and says that uh, the light, the logos, it is Jesus and not somebody else. It's not somebody who's going to come in the future. And so if anyone chooses to believe this fact, it says in verse 12, that person will be given the right that person would be given the legal right to become a child of God. So that person will not be born of, uh, of flesh and blood. That is what it says in verse 13. Such a person who has placed his belief and trust in uh, Jesus Christ 
that person is not going to be just born out of the flesh the way humans are born but something extra is going to happen to that person that person is also going to be born of god so over here in this verses 12 and 13 the details of this is not given but then later on when we go to john chapter 3 in the conversation with nicodemus these things get clarified further okay so uh, we see these things being brought out in verses uh, 6 to 13 and then if we were to move on into verses 14 to 18 um, so here is where it says uh, that he became flesh the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us okay so uh, this is one important point that you know we need to emphasize before we close our class um, so the word of god the logos he becomes flesh and he dwells among us and that word that is used over there this also is mentioned actually in your notes um, that word over there dwelling um, you know where it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us that word is the greek word skenu s-k-e-n-o-o -O. and that is the exact word which is used in the greek old testament we know right the old testament was written in the hebrew language and then uh, when the people of israel began to become more familiar with aramaic and with greek rather than with hebrew they could no longer really read hebrew though they were speaking it in their homes but they could no, no longer read it and be able to pronounce it properly so you know they were becoming more uh, familiar with aramaic and greek so at that point of time uh, godly people came together and began to translate the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek language so that people can continue to read it and understand it. Uh, so in the Greek Old Testament, the Greek word which is used to describe the tabernacle of God, it's literally this word skenu. And so now here, um, John is using the specific word and he's saying, you know what, this Jesus, he became flesh and he came and he made his skenu, his dwelling, his tabernacle among us. Now, the significance of this would have been huge for the Jewish people because they are familiar with their Old Testament. And, you know, it says in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, this is what it says in Exodus 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle. You know, that's basically the skenu. The cloud covered the skenu of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the skenu. So the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. Now that same glory has come down. Earlier it, 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 it was only inside the confines of the tabernacle. And once the glory comes down upon the tabernacle, nobody even has the guts to go inside. You know, because in their unclean, uncovered form, where the blood of Jesus is not yet covering them, they would be finished because now we have we are covered in the righteousness of christ uh, you know we, we are very safe and secure but back then once the glory of the lord comes into that skenu they cannot even enter it um, so that same glory has now become flesh and is happily walking around is literally dwelling with the people interacting with them having meals in their homes and it's an amazing thing so he says over here, John, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. So this Kenu who could only be inside the confines of the tabernacle when the glory of God comes down upon that tabernacle. Now he's literally, he's now become a moving, talking tabernacle. He literally is walking around everywhere. He's literally the glory of God in physical form. And he's walking around and he's interacting with people and showing people that this is what God is like. So um, when it says we have seen his glory, what did John mean? Was he saying that, you know, wherever Jesus walked around, you had, you know, bright sparks of light coming out of his skin? No. Jesus looked as sweaty and as human as everyone else. You know, they would, they would, they would literally walk from town to town. So they would not, Jesus was not looking all bright and shiny. There was no halo around him. So in what sense did they see his glory? 
they literally saw the way god would behave they literally saw the way god would talk the way god, the way um, yahweh interacts with humans that's the way jesus is interacting with humans the kind of love that yahweh feels you know these this people of israel they've been worshiping yahweh for centuries but they've never seen him they don't know what he's actually like and now they're actually getting to see in physical form how loving he is how wise and clever he is in his wording in the way he talks how tender he is for towards people who are in need these are things which they are discovering for the first time so in that sense you know uh, here uh, john says we have literally seen his glory the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth uh, and so on a day to day basis jesus this logos reveals what the glory of god is like all right so uh, these are the verses you know these are the main points that we wanted to bring out from the prologue uh, so um, we will continue this in the next class uh, so i hope that at least to some extent uh, the prologue was useful to you not just as information but also helping you to draw closer to him you know exercise greater faith in him Uh, so let's just close with a word of prayer yeah lord we just thank you so much for the things that we could learn from the first few verses of the john's gospel thank you o lord for choosing to become flesh and come and dwell among us so that you can show us literally in the flesh what yahweh is like how loving and compassionate he is how all powerful he is without any limits and lord we thank you that you were willing to even sacrifice yourself for us and so we pray o oh lord that even as we go through this book of john we would really know you um in a very intimate and real way and i pray that you would help us to believe in you more and more because that's the whole point of this gospel of john to help us believe in jesus and you know make him our foundation so i pray that all that we learn o oh lord in the rest of this course it will cause us to draw nearer to jesus and place our faith in him and build our lives on him thank you in jesus name amen thank you so much and yes we will meet again next class next class if you can have doubts and questions and give your feedback and your you know um, thoughts on the things that we are saying all you need to do is raise your hand over there you know with your press the icon which raises the Uh, raise the hand icon or if you can you know actually um, appear on camera and raise your hand that's also fine uh, that would make it so interactive for all of us all right thank you so much yes thank you pastor thank you pastor thank you